Please, would you turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 <clears throat> this morning. And I've entitled this message, No Shortcuts with Christ. No Shortcuts with Christ. And we're going to start reading <clears throat> from verse 16. Acts chapter 20, verse 16. And it says, And Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. Now, when it says sail by Ephesus, it actually means he determined not to stop in Ephesus. That's what it actually means there. Because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Malta he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept nothing, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews, also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And we'll stop our reading there. Let us all just bow in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we are found in the house of the Lord this morning. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for a privilege to have that sense, Lord, of you moving in the midst of us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that very precious blood. Lord, that old rugged cross, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for thy salvation, O God. We thank you, Lord, that you, Lord, have called us by name. Lord, that you have called us out of darkness into your glorious light. Lord, into that kingdom. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's our heart's desire, Lord, that you being our great example, that we should follow, Lord. And Lord, that we, Lord, should proclaim that gospel. And Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, Lord, that you would guide me through, Lord, your word. Lord, that your spirit, Lord, would just move in the midst of your people. Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that you hide me behind your beautiful self this morning. And Lord Jesus, I just pray, Lord, come and have thy way in your meeting this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, Paul here, <clears throat> he's in a place called Miletus, which is about 30 miles outside of Ephesus. And what we've just read here is Paul basically calling the elders of the church out of Ephesus to himself so he can, if you like, just speak to them for the last time. Now, Ephesus was a place if you maybe even picture it in your mind, had a mighty, mighty dock. All the ships would go and there was a lot of trading went on there. 
Scholars said it was a beautiful city, wealthy city. But on the skyline, you would have seen a massive temple. And this was to the goddess, Diana. You see, when Paul had gone there to Ephesus and he would have preached the gospel, there started to be a mighty move of God. The Lord really started to move. The Lord started to save and started to challenge hearts. But with it, it was opposition. It was opposition. The silversmiths that used to make the small idols, that used to go in the groves and the high places, were starting to see their business drop. And they didn't like it. They didn't like it. And they really went after Paul. They really went after Paul. But he's given these elders a bit of advice, if you like. And he's using his own life as an example to them. As we see as what he is speaking to them in what we have just read. But we have to notice something about Paul. He was never, never half-hearted. He was fully committed to what he was doing. And no more than you see this then. When you see him as he writes these letters to the other churches, you see even in Philippians 2 and 16, he says this, he says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And in other words, he said, I would gladly give my life if it would glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We see what he says to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit per perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And you see Paul here was heartbroken over the sin of the church. Heartbroken over it. And he was saying to them, put it away. Put your flesh away. The Spirit of God arise in you. The Spirit. He even reminds them, he says, you're not your own, but you're bought with a price. Bought with a price. Took the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He reminds them. He preached unto this holiness. And a life lived according to the word of God. Colossian church. He says this in Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. He says for this cause we also since the day we heard of it. Do not cease to pray for you. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthily of the Lord unto all, all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. His desire was for mature Christians, not babes in Christ. He says, I pray that you grow up. I pray that you mature. So when we look through what Paul said in those verses, in Acts chapter 20. I want to sort of take you through a few verses that we have read. In verse 19 he says this. He says. In serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And the Greek here for that gives an idea of having a humble opinion of oneself. A humble opinion. It means having a deep sense of a moral obligation. This is what it gives the idea of. And in other words, Paul was different. It gives the idea that Paul was different because when he went and preached, he wasn't like the teachers of the day and he wasn't like the Pharisees of the day or the Sadducees or anybody like that because they would have loved to have gathered together a, a, a following unto themselves. Look how great I am. Look how intelligent I am. Paul wasn't doing that. 
Paul didn't want followers of Paul. He wanted followers of Christ. That was the difference. And that's what the Greek gives over to us. And especially in this day and age, I find that so many Christians can be taken away with preachers and what they say. And I'm being reverent now to what I say because I know we need preachers. But what I'm trying to say is we need preachers preaching the word, not their own thoughts or we fairy tales there and there. And yet this is what is being latched onto today. There's current trends of things that are happening in the church, but you can't find them in the Word. Can't find them in the Word. But Paul wasn't like that. Paul was trying to get men and women grounded in Christ. And that's what he preached. And if there was ever a time we needed men and women grounded in Christ, it's today. This nation needs men and women grounded in Christ. Not in fairy stories. And then he says in the verse, he says, with many tears. Now you know Paul was a passionate man. He was passionate about everything that he did. But he was passionate about people. But he also knew he had a responsibility. And this is something I think that really escapes people. And when I say the church, please, brother and sister, remember I mean the whole body of Christ. I'm not just talking about this church. I mean the church in general. There was a responsibility there. No greater was there a responsibility that came with preaching the word. I do believe that responsibility has left the men that stand up in the pulpit in our nation today. When was the last time, and I'm just being honest, the men stood in a pulpit that had a sleepless night about the word of God that they were going to bring to the people. When was the last time? Because of the responsibility of the weight of God upon that man to bring the word of God. You don't hear that anymore. When he says with tears, he knew the responsibility. He knew that he had a heart for God's people because he wanted them to go on. That's what it means with tears. And then he says temptations. And this amazed me when I started to look in the, in the Greek of what temptations meant. It means an experience for good or for bad. It actually means a discipline or a, or a provocation. Yes, it does mean a temptation. But also it means a proving ground. A proving ground. When you look at everything that Paul went through and the, and the Jews were laying in wait for him, all these temptations, they were trying to hinder him at every corner. They were trying to kill him. Trying to do everything they could to stop him. But Paul conducted himself in a manner that was probably his greatest witness because he conducted himself as a man of God in all of it. And people could see it. People could see it for all to see. He proved he was a man of God by his actions in the midst of all of that. Even First Peter 4, 12 and 13 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in as much ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Brother and sister, I'm going to be honest with you, it's not going to be plain sailing, far from it. You preach the word, you take on the name of Jesus Christ, you'll start to see opposition. You'll start to see people come against you. You may even start to see friends that you may be known for years want nothing more to do with you. It's not a loss. Let me tell you that. There's a great prize to be had. His name is Christ and he is beautiful. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 20 now, if you look at verse 20 with me, 
He says, and how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you. And this is amazing. I mean, I always think in my own mind that, that Dr. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And this just, to, to me, this just backs up that Dr. Luke wrote this book because you see that word, kept back nothing, is actually a medical term in the Greek. And it's a medical term to withhold food from a patient. That's what it means. And what he's trying to say is, I didn't hold anything back. In other words, he says, I didn't hold anything back to build you up. That's what he means. In other words, he says, despite everything that was happening, everything that was going on, he says, I dedicated myself to pouring into any vessel, any vessel that came to the Lord. Paul literally poured himself into people so they would know the word, so they would know Jesus Christ. And that's what he means. He wanted them to grow up. He wanted to make disciples. It's something you don't hear of nowadays, but disciples were disciplined men and women of God because they were going to need to be because of everything that was happening, especially around Ephesus at that time. And even wherever they went, wherever they went. And then in verse 21, he says, testifying to both the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God. Paul in this verse is referring, this time is recorded in Acts uh, 19, 8 to 10. He preached first to the Jews in the synagogue for three months. And then to the Jews and the Greeks, he preached in the school of Tyrannius. And then he spent two years in Asia preaching the gospel. But the most amazing point that is made in verse 21. He sums up exactly what he preached in two words. Repentance and faith. That's it. Repentance. To literally turn away. It means literally to do a 360. Completely turn your back on something. And yet when you hear repentance in the church today, oh, don't say that. Repentance offends. Repentance is like a dirty word. You can't say that anymore. Brother and sister, we need to repent. You have to repent. We all do at times. We have to say, Lord, no, we can't continue like this. At some point in our lives, we are going to have to say we need to turn around and turn away from something, whatever it may be. And then faith. Paul's not talking about wishy-washy faith here. Paul's talking about real faith. He's talking about true faith. And let me tell you something. Within the next three verses, Paul gives you an example of what faith is. And I want you to listen to these. I'm going to read them to you again. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me. Neither count I, I my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Let me ask you something, brother. If the Spirit of God in every place you went said, you're going to get afflictions, you're going to get persecuted, if you go there, would you still go? I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I would. But Paul says, I'm bound in the Spirit. In other words, the Greek gives the idea, I have a duty to perform and nothing is going to keep me from it. Paul had a sense of duty about him. And even though the spirit witnessed of this, of his afflictions, 
witnessed what was going to happen to him. And I believe Paul knew exactly what was going to happen to him because he even said to the elders, this is the last time you're going to see me. He knew it would result in his death and yet he still went. Paul gives us an example here of total surrender to the will and spirit of God. You know, we look at this man's life. We look at the power that flowed through him. The empowerment, the mighty empowerment of the Holy Spirit upon this man. But we have to ask the question, how was it that the Spirit was able to move through this man so mightily? And there's two aspects you'll always see to Paul's life that always stands out to me. He always strived to live a holy life before God. And the other thing was, he yielded to Jesus Christ completely. Everything. And the thing that stands out is that there is no shortcuts with Jesus Christ. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. And the thing is, when you read about Paul, there's another thing that will always stand out to you as well. Boy, what a relationship with Christ this man had. You could never doubt that. You let your eye run down <clears throat> with me, please, to verse 26. He says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know what? We should never shun to declare the counsel of God. All of it. It doesn't happen very often now. There's bits and pieces taken. Oh, I like that bit. Don't like that bit like this bit but I don't really like that no everything everything has to be declared from this book whether it fits in with our theology whether it doesn't so if you like if you want a breakdown of these verses Paul's example that he leaves the Ephesian elders in verse 19 is to serve the Lord no matter what in verse 20 is to hold nothing back in the building up of the saints. In verse 21, he testifies repentance and faith towards Jesus Christ. In verses 22 to 24, he says to yield to the Spirit and the will of God completely in surrender. In verses 26 and 27, he says, preach the full counsel of God. Brother and sister, if you ever wanted a recipe for a revival in the land, well, there you've just got it. Because that's what it's going to take. That's why he said it to the elders at Ephesus. He says, there's a move of the Spirit. This is how you've got to continue to do it. You see, the church this day is when you're I mentioned afflictions and tears and repentance. It's something that just doesn't seem to compute with our church nowadays. People say, well, that prior preaching doesn't do any good to anybody. Well, it's funny because Paul preached it. Jesus preached it. The prophets preached it in the Old Testament. It's declared all the way through the Bible. Well, let me ask you, when is the truth ever popular? Nobody likes to hear the truth. Let's be honest. But the Lord Jesus Christ loves us enough to tell us the truth of who we really are. 
And now we see massive churches filled to the brim. Music, lights flashing. You think you're in a nightclub. And to be honest with you, people say, can you feel the move of the Spirit? They have their hands in the air and they say, well, look, we're just worshipping and we can really feel the move of the Spirit. Well, let me tell you something. Feelings are very easily induced. You put a piece of secular music on, whether it's a love song, whether it's something a bit more angrier, you'll start to get the feeling of love, you'll start to get the feeling of angriness. Maybe if you're feeling a bit down and you can even stick a comedy on the tally. Maybe even make you start laughing and raise a smile. Feelings can be easily induced. Let me tell you something. True worship. True worship is when a life is dedicated unto Christ. When his whole actions exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not when all the music's playing. It's not when everything else. I mean, I've often said this before. You see, when you've seen the disciples out and they were praying for the sick. And they were praying for people and they were preaching on the street corners. Not even the disciples, even the reformers. Even the early Pentecostals, did they have all the worship? Did they have all that going on? No, because the whole life was dedicated to Christ. It moved through them. The Spirit of God, they didn't have to go by a feeling. They knew Christ was with them. They knew that he was within them. And that's how they lived. That's how they lived. They didn't need all the bells and whistles. They knew who their God was. They knew where he was. It was a price for following Christ. I'm not going to say any difference because it's the truth. It's a price for following him. In Acts uh, Acts 9 and 16 it says this. This is what the Lord said about Paul. He says, For I will show him the great things that he must suffer for my name's sake. Brother and sister, can you imagine that? The great things this man would suffer for his name's sake. There was a price to be paid. There was a cost to it. And you have to remember that this man, Paul, or Saul, as his name was. He was the rising star of the Sanhedrin. He had everything that the world could offer him. He had prestige. He had influence. He would have had a great wealth. But in all honesty, he was willing to give this all up when he experienced Jesus Christ in his life. You see, there was nothing that could compare In Philippians 3 and 10 it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And everybody would say, amen, yes, we want the power of his resurrection. But finish the verse. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. We want the power of the resurrection. Paul said, I'll know him through the fellowship of his sufferings. Let's be honest, church. Hebrews 11, 24 and 25, we see a similar story. Look what it says in Hebrews 11, 24 and 25. It says this. It says, by faith, by faith. Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Can you imagine Moses in the greatest kingdom in the world, Egypt? It was literally the jewel in the crown of the world at the time. He was in one of the most powerful positions in the world at the side of Pharaoh. He'd have been treated like a god. That's just, that's just the truth. Yet he left it all behind. 
to become a shepherd, to live in the wilderness. He left everything. But let me tell you something. Moses had some of the greatest experience ever recorded in our Bible with God. And he's seen some of the greatest miracles that the Bible has ever recorded as well. He left, if you like, the greatest kingdom in the world and he wouldn't be called the Pharaoh's daughter or the son of Pharaoh, should I say. But he wanted to be called the man of God. It's a far greater title than any title the world can ever give you. It's to be called a man or a woman of God. So why was Paul persecuted so much? Simple. It was for the truth. And I always say, you know, the greatest praise that Paul ever got, I always think this is funny, was out of the man that was possessed. You can laugh at me now, aren't you? But it's the truth. Acts 19, read from verse 13, and it says this, it says, and a certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name, which had evil spirits, the name of Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons, one of Seba, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Isn't that fantastic? When the old devils can say, Jesus, we know. And Paul, we know. I wonder how many of us, in all honesty, the devils would know our name. And it amazes me that at times when you read the Bible, I'm just going to be honest with you, the devils can seem to make more sense than people. And let's be honest. They had the sense to fall down at the feet of Christ. When Jesus Christ was preaching at people and they turned their back on him. But you know why they knew Paul? And it was this reason. Wherever he went, he had two things. He either had a revival or a riot. Wherever he went. And you see, to be honest with you, we either have neither... Sometimes I'd rather have a right than nothing, to be honest with you. At least you know people are passionate about something then. We have neither. But I love what Paul said, he says, I have nothing. Paul said, I have nothing. Yet I possess all things. Isn't that beautiful? I have nothing, but I possess all things. Material things, he had nothing. Yeah, this man had power over death. He had power over disease. He had power over devils. This man had a wealth that money couldn't buy because he had a spiritual wealth. He had an intimacy with Christ. You can't buy that. This man was intimate with him. He loved him. He poured himself out for him and in the service for his Lord. Paul had everything because he had Christ. I love what Leonard Ravenel said. Listen to this. He said, we raise our hats to the martyrs. They died, persecuted, forsaken, ostracized and penniless. We thank God for their last drop of blood, but we won't give him our first drop of blood. We won't give it to the Lord. We won't give it to for revival. won't give it but in all honesty there's no shortcuts even the devil when I, the master was in the wilderness he tempted him and he said all these kingdoms are yours if you just bow down and worship me 
You notice something that the Lord never rebuked him and called him a liar for that. Because they were all his. I mean, he was, he's the, domi the domineering power over the world system. So the Lord Jesus could have had a shortcut. But let me tell you something. The Lord knew full well that he already had victory over the devil. And he was going to take it all from him. If he would have took that shortcut, there would have been no victory in it. There would have been no victory over the devil. There would have been no victory over sin. There would have been no victory for man. When he went to the cross, he crushed everything. The devil was completely and utterly defeated. And the Lord knew it only full, to, full well. His time was up. The Lord had a plan. And he had a purpose. And let me tell you something. You don't have to do anything for the devil to hate you. He just hates you. I'm just being honest. Do you know why? Because you remind him of the Lord. Because you're made in his image. And that's why whenever you see this world system... You have drink, you have drugs, you have everything else, and it's all designed to destroy man, to pull him down. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is the lifter up of heads. He's the lifter up of men and women. He is the one that will strengthen you. He is the one that will pick you up. You can put your faith in anything else. You can put your faith in man and be nothing like if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and I mean fully fully I'll leave you with this in John 14 and 6 Jesus said this Jesus said unto him he said I am the way the truth and the life and no man cometh unto the father but by me So he's the way. There's only one way. The preaching of the gospel that reveals Jesus Christ to people. He's that way. He's the truth, the truth of the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, the word. And he is the life. In all honesty, there is no life outside of Jesus Christ. Because everything is death. He is life. To be honest with you, even when I was looking these verses last night, to be honest with you, early hours of this morning, just mulling over it, the Spirit has spoke unto this church many times. It's talked about blessing, it's talked about how he's got to expand the borders, and I totally believe that. You can feel the spirit start to move in this place. And it's fantastic. I do believe that we are going to reach other countries and expand. I totally believe that. And what form that will take, I don't know, but I leave that up to the Lord. I think there's a great blessing to be had, but also, to be honest with you, the spirit has spoken. It's not going to be easy. And the verse hit me when it says, I am bound by the Spirit to go on to Jerusalem. Let me tell you something, church. The Spirit is leading us in a direction where we need to be going. But I do believe it's got to cause a riot. There's got to be plenty of opposition. But we need to know one thing. We are bound by the Spirit to go and fulfill his will and not ours. So I just want to leave you remembering what Paul said to the elders to serve the Lord even in the hardest of times serve him. To hold nothing back 
to pour out into people, to advance them and to try and grow them up grounded in Christ the best that we can. to testify of repentance and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ in everything. To yield to the Spirit and the will of God. And to do our best to be completely surrendered to Him. And finally, to preach the full counsel of God through the Word of Jesus Christ. In all honesty, <clears throat> everything in this world, every affliction we go through, anything that we go through for Christ, you see on that day when we stand before the Lord, how many of us truly want to hear, well done, my true and faithful servant? I'm telling you something, that's reward enough. But you see the riches of the kingdom the riches of earth's glory, I can't even begin to tell you because these lips couldn't even describe them. This world is nothing compared to the glory of Christ. And let us remember that. We should have eternity blazed in our hearts because that was what we're going to spend with him. This is just a vapour. This is just a vapour. So church, I just pray and just honestly mean this I do believe a move of Christ is coming a powerful move of Christ but we need to be more than ever to stand firm in this this is our example Christ is our example and even if the apostle Paul was studying now he would tell you he was nothing without Jesus Christ and I mean that reverently but he wasn't because Christ was everything so let's stand firm on this word. In Jesus' name, thank you for listening.